Good evening. Welcome all, uh, everyone here. My name is Ivo Dalder. I am the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and it is my great pleasure to welcome to the Council President Nana Akufo Addo to Chicago and to the Council on Global Affairs. Uh, for nearly a century, we have gathered, uh, not in this room, but in this town, uh, to bring different voices from around the world together to uh, understand what is happening in the world and why it matters to people here in Chicago. So we're extremely honored today to hear from the President of Ghana about the country's great growth and the progress it has made to date and its plans for the future. The Republic of Ghana is widely considered to be a shining star in sub-Saharan Africa. With growing economic strength and a strong democratic political system, that recently experienced another peaceful transition of power, Ghana's success means further prosperity for its people, for the West African region, and for the African continent. We here in the United States have enjoyed a long-standing friendship with Ghana, and we're proud to continue a tradition of open dialogue and collaborative partnering uh, with uh, leaders from the continent as we work to address the critical issues affecting our respective countries and regions. Now, before we begin the program, I would like to offer a warm welcome uh, to our esteemed guests here in the room, uh, Nana Asante Bediatuo, who is the Secretary to the President, and Beatrice Tayui, who has been instrumental in helping to arrange uh, this visit. Thank you all for being with here tonight, and now I'd like to introduce you all to our guest of honor, mm -hmm. President Akufo Addo. He has served as President of Ghana since 2017 as a member of the new Patriotic Party. He has served his country in numerous capacities as a member of parliament, as the Attorney General, and as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He, has, uh, uh, he holds degrees in economics from the University of Ghana and read law in England at the Middle Temple. He's been honored with numerous awards for his commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, human rights, and to social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Council President Akufo Addo. So, Pre <clears throat> President Dada, um, members of the Council, first of all, I want to thank you very much for having me this afternoon here. Um, I came to America on Thursday to come and take up speaking engagements at Harvard and this morning at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's been an eventful time and um, it's been very enjoyable. It also had an important milestone for me personally, which is that I spent my 75th birthday here in America at Harvard on Friday. <laughs> So, um, yes, today I had the opportunity, the big privilege of addressing the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago, and also met your famous mayor, uh, Mr. Ram Emanuel, before coming here. I thought it would be useful for me to come um, and visit with you, largely because the developments that are taking place on the African continent, we're finding that America is very absent in, that, in those developments. I think there's every reason for us to try and find a bridge so that America becomes more present in the life of Africa. Two things that are of potentially great significance for us. One, of course, is the democratic system of government, which you are one of the beacons, one of its great pioneers. Our continent increasingly is turning away from authoritarian rule and authoritarian government and embarking down the path of democratic accountability. So relations with the United States of America can only fortify and strengthen that process. Secondly, the biggest deficit that we have 
the deficit in the application of technology to our lives. It accounts for so much, which represents the, the poverty of our continent, the contradiction that even though we live on the richest continents in the world, in terms of natural resources, we are told, for instance, that 30% of the world's remaining minerals are to be found on the continent of Africa. We've got tremendous forests, lakes, all the ingredients, and also a huge and vibrant youth population. We're the youngest continent in the world. Despite all of this, our people are the poorest on the planet. That contradiction is what public policy, the development of our institutions, has to address. But then there's a role that you can play from here in helping address that. Our country is in some ways a microcosm of what has happened to, the cons to, to Africa since independence. I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but we were the first in sub-Saharan Africa to become free from colonial rule. We did so under the leadership of our charismatic leader, who has gone down in history as one of the most celebrated Africans, Kwame Nkrumah, who in fact spent his youth here in America, came to university in America. But the story since independence for some time was not a good story. But a series of unstable governments. We managed in the period of some 25, 30 years to have three republics. Nkrumah's own republic was overthrown. The Second Republic and the Third Republics both went. We're now in our Fourth Republic. There's some who say that uh, even the most unstable of the European, the great European nations, France, it took them 150 years to arrive at five republics. It took us 40 years to arrive at four. So there was a need for us to try and find a consensus about how best our country could be governed to be able to ensure stability. But without the framework, a proper governmental framework, as you know, it's very difficult to address the issues of development. In 1992, 26 years ago, now nearly 27 years ago, the nation and the more, uh, the more active political forces in the nation decided that the Fourth Republic would be a democratic s s republic, multi-party democratic state, governed according to the rule of law, respectful of human rights, and we wrote a liberal democratic constitution. There had been a lot of debate on the continent in our country the multi-party democracy would bring about divisions, dissensions, ethnic and tribal arrangements in our country. It would be a source of instability. But I think these 25 years, now going on for 26 years in Ghana, has exposed all of that thinking and all of that learning is, is essentially self-serving. Uh, for those who wanted to be persons of that absolute power in our country. The Fourth Republic has been the most stable of the four republics we've had. We have been able within it and its constitution to organize on three separate occasions peaceful transfers of power from one political party to another. In fact, it is the third of such transitions that brought me to the seat of the presidency. So now, we believe strongly that democratic principles and democratic values have now become firmly entrenched in the body politic of Ghana. It has therefore provided us with a strong framework to deal with the matter that concerns most our people, as their poverty and their living conditions. 
and how come it is that they're living on the richest continent in the world, and yet they're the poorest. There's several factors to that, some internal, a few external, that have brought that about. We now have an opportunity to do something about it. And doing something about it, essentially, is identifying and pursuing the appropriate policy prescriptions that would allow growth and development of our economies to take place. When we came into office, for instance, the rate of growth of the Ghanaian economy was then at 3.6 percent of our GDP. It was the lowest in nearly two decades. A year after we took office, the measures that we brought, and then the economy grew at 8.5 percent of the GDP growth. The second year, 6.8 percent. This year is projected to grow at 7.9 percent and is reckoned as the two or three fastest growing economies on the continent. We want to maintain that trajectory for at least a decade, because that is the way we can see as being the most effective way of breaking the, the circle of poverty that our country has been in. The resources of the country are considerable. But like the rest of the continent, most of those resources have been exploited to, to the benefit of foreigners, who, uh, those who, who, who are not part of us, and on the large sums of money that leave our continent and our countries. As we now well documented, a few years ago, the African Union, together with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, appointed a high-level panel chaired by the former South African President Thabo Mbeki to look at illicit financial outflows from the continent. It turned out by their calculations, and those calculations have not really been challenged since then, is that annually some 50 billion minimum United States dollars of illicit financial outflows take place from the continent of Africa. 56 percent of those figures are derived from the extractive industries, as you can imagine, from oil, from gold, from mining. So that's a major challenge for us. We want to find a solution to how we can engage with companies coming to do business in our, on our continent, but then who will be fair with us, who will be honest with us in their accounting, and who will share the profits that come from the enterprise in an equitable manner. It's a major challenge, because most people in the world uh, are not predisposed to fairness. Um, and the idea that if you can get it, you relinquish it is not something that most businesses find uh, intelligent. But we have to do it. In doing so, we have also to find the ways of building up our own enterprises so that they can take a, a leading role in the development of our economies and of our continent. Not just our enterprises, also, of course, about our agriculture and our capacity to feed ourselves. A small country like Ghana, 30 million people, we spend $2.5 billion every year importing foodstuffs. Those kind of statistics are not sustainable. They're not right. We have to find a way to improve and enhance the productivity of our agriculture and make it possible for our farmers also to earn decent living. So these are the challenges. The challenges are across the board. There are the challenges of institutions, of infrastructure, both physical and social. 
education is a major challenge for us. Not enough of our young people are in school. It is important that we find mechanisms that allows all of them to find their way into school. We began in Ghana a system whereby from kindergarten up to the end of secondary school in the public sector, it will be free. We're redefining basic education to mean that from kindergarten up to the end of secondary school. And it is the intention of my government that in the course of the year we'll bring legislation that will make education compulsory up to the end of secondary education. This free senior high school policy that we initiated when I came into office two years ago has had a dramatic impact on the educational infrastructure of our country. Over nearly 300,000 students, more students, have entered second senior high school than were there before I came into office. We want to continue growing the country this way. At the same time, we're now putting a great deal of emphasis on technical and vocational training. That had been something that had been a major lack. Um, this year alone, we're establishing some 21 state-of-the-art TVET institutions across the country. Reforms are taking place also in our tertiary educational system, so that we're having this comprehensive review of the educational infrastructure of our country to make it much more fit for the 21st century. And in all of this, the emphasis on uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the so-called STEM uh, subjects is now becoming the central feature of our education. Clearly, we have to uh, have a, a system where the, the our young people instinctively familiarize themselves with digital technology. It is the way. It is the way of the future. And if we don't have, we, are, we don't have. We don't get in on the ground floor of that. We don't make the effort. A key part of the educational reforms that we're making is upgrading the quality of teachers that we have inside our system. Up to now, the qualifications that you require to teach in our schools varied considerably. We're now insisting that you have to have a Bachelor of Education, a degree in education before you can teach at any level of our education, whether primary, uh, secondary, or tertiary. And in that sense, too, uh, we're upgrading the teacher training colleges and themselves into universities of education so that we can have that critical mass of teachers to be able to address this critical challenge. One of them is also uh, a university to train uh, TVET teachers. So th the, the reforms that are, being t are taking place are, bec uh, we're doing so on the understanding that the world that you have today, physical resources alone is not what does it. You have to have a labor force that is capable of, the, uh, of, uh, of absor absorbing, assimilating, today's technology and today's knowledge. We have also undertaken important reforms in our industrial development. Very sluggish and very low growth by the time we took office. But the structural transformation of our economy, the movement of that economy from being a a low growth, uh, low value agrarian economy into a high value industrialized economy. That transformation is at the heart of the prospects we have for growth. 
And that, of course, means that industrial activity has to take a real front, pay, front place front the, uh, in our development planning and growth. Ghana has considerable natural resources that, with proper application, can transform the, in our industrial sector. Take, for instance, bauxite. We have bauxite in considerable quantities in the country. Within the African context, only Guinea in West Africa has more deposits than we do. Up to now, it has lain dormant in the ground. Uh, the effort that was made in the early years of independence with, uh, in Kwame Nkrumah's time to bring the bauxite into play failed. He came to an agreement with Kaiser, with Edgar Kaiser, that Kaiser would help us build a dam that would provide hydroelectric power cheaply for his smelter that would then refine Ghanaian bauxite and allow us to establish in Ghana um, an integrated aluminum industry. It didn't happen. The dam was built, the power was brought into play, but the Kaiser Corporation continued to depend on its Jamaican mines for the supply of the raw bauxite. So the Ghanaian bauxite basically stayed in the ground. We have seen the lessons of that and are determined to give value to, to it by insisting on uh, the exploitation of the bauxite, the entire value chain within Ghana. Aluminum, as we all know, and it's constantly being told, is the metal of the future. We want to be one of its principal producers. We've established a public corporation, with the Ghana Integrated Bauxite Development Corporation, to be the focal point of this development. It's been made possible because of an arrangement that we've had with a very important Chinese company called the Sidrohino Corporation. They are advancing to our, my government some $2 billion worth of money to develop our infrastructure. And against it, we are, it's a barter arrangement. We are to pay them back with aluminum products. We've got a moratorium of some three years to be able to establish the facilities for the development of the bauxite, at the end of which we can then begin the supply of bauxite to China, but uh, the supply of aluminum for, to China to pay for the money that has been advanced to us. We uh, have to make these arrangements because we're determined this time around to develop these resources. And we recognize that the Chinese, at least, are interested in collaborating with us for that purpose. So today we have strong economic relations with them, hinging on these kind of initiatives. They will provide us the opportunity to address both the deficit we have with our infrastructure, our roads and railways, and at the same time also to give us that lift, that basic lift in terms of our industrial development. The other main matter that I want to give you a brief glimpse about is the development of our agriculture. Despite abandoned land, arable land, water, a hardworking population. Policies in agriculture up to now had been deficient, so we were still dependent on importation of foreign foodstuffs, 
from our neighbors and abroad. In the two years that I've been in office, we've been able to change that picture. And today, we've become, again, a net exporter of food. We have a program which we call Planting for Food and Jobs that has now some one million farmers uh, within the program who are the beneficiaries of uh, improved seedlings, subsidized fertilizers. We're now able to get them the technical uh, expertise in the form of extension officers who help the farmers. And with these stimuli, the agriculture, the far farmers have now been able to turn our country around from being a net importer of foodstuffs to a net exporter of foodstuffs. Even then, we still have important challenges. We're still importing things that we can grow ourselves, like rice. Um, we've made um, considerable strides, and the program has it that this year we will reduce our rice importations by some 50 percent. Um, the agricultural development is also the obvious and most direct link with the industrial transformation, because we have the agro-industries that matter for us providing the lead in that respect, and a major one hinges around one of our major sources of foreign earnings, that's cocoa. Between us and our Ivorian neighbors, we're responsible for 65% of the world's output of cocoa. The chocolate industry which hinges on, the, on cocoa's raw, its raw material, is a $100 billion uh, United States dollar industry. Well, the farmers, the basic producers, earn a pittance of that amount. We earn something like $6 billion, some 6% at the best of the value chain of our cocoa. This is yet another set of statistics that we have to change. We can't change it in isolation. We look at the structure of the world market. So we're now working very closely with the Ivorians to synchronize our policy and therefore strengthen each other in being able to convert as much of the cocoa that our farmers produce into domestic production, the various elements of the value chain of cocoa. So that is an exercise that's ongoing at the moment. We anticipate important results from it. We think it's an area which would allow for engagement across the, the board, of the investors, one sort or another. We're hoping to be able to entice some of the major chocolate producers to come and base in Ghana, to take advantage of the new policies. We're working at it. But uh, Kroso Modo, um, this is a, a quick bird's eye view of what's happening in the country. And it's intended to give you a flavor of what's going on in Ghana. And I think by extension from Ghana to the wider African continent, you can see in the recital, the recount that I've made, that there are lots and lots of opportunities for investment in the country. And that's what we're seeking. We want to diminish considerably our reliance on foreign aid as a way of propelling our economy. So far, aid has not, in fact, helped us make the transformation of our economy that we want. And we don't think that there is a future in fashioning economic policy that is dependent on aid from foreign donors. In saying that, it's not that we want to opt out of the world, far from it, 
We want to increase very much more our trade and investment cooperation with various countries in the world. Your country, for instance, has been very generous to Ghana. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've had two major grants, uh, transactions with America under the auspices of the Millennium Challenge account. We had compact number one, which provided us with some $547 million. It was a compact that was negotiated by President Kufo and President Bush. It was very satisfactorily performed and enabled us to also enter the uh, Compact Two, which is ongoing as we speak. Slightly less than $500 million, the second compact, uh, to be able to stimulate power generation in our country. I think all this is very well, and we are very appreciative of these interventions. But really, investment and trade with America would yield as much more value than these elements of aid. And that's where we want to transform the relationship. I was excited about the new initiative of the Trump administration, he, the Build Act, I believe that he's, they, they call it, which has established the United States International Finance Development Corporation with uh, an initial $60 billion equity capital. Hopefully, uh, access to these funds is not going to be too bureaucratic, and uh, it, it, will, it, it will be relatively straightforward, because if it is, it could be an, uh, a very good catalyst for American investment in the continent, which we would welcome. So, Mr. President. This is a, a brief view of what's going on in my country. It's a wonderful, uh, uh, what is it? uh, in, in, in 25 minutes, I think you've sketched a picture that all of us can see quite, quite clearly and uh, clearly demonstrates both the amazing progress that has already been made, but also the challenges that still need to be overcome and the opportunities that exist to, to make that possible, which is true for Ghana and probably true for the, the continent as a whole. Um, a more important place uh, on earth there isn't than where so many people are uh, looking for a future that can be provided. So let me open up the, the, the conversation to others here in the room. Uh, you heard the plea not only for investment but for an American presence, um, uh, which is how you started up. Uh, and uh, let me therefore open it up. Adele, I'll start with Adele. Oh, oh, uh, King, you already have a microphone and then uh, Adele. I would like the uh, <clears throat> president to elaborate some more about his plan for co for cocoa, cocoa. Uh, very interesting what you had to say about working with the Ivory Coast on a combined program. What specific first and second steps do you have to get international companies to process more of the raw material within Ghana and the Ivory Coast? First of all, we have to increase substantially our warehousing capacity because without it, any serious effort to process our cocoa will be very difficult. So as things are standing now, the African Development Bank has committed itself to giving us a large sum of money, us being the Cote d'Ivoire and ourselves, a large sum of money to finance the construction of these warehouses. The second is the cooperation between us in attempting to align our pricing policy for the raw material so that there's a certain stability that will be given to processes. And then thirdly, a joint campaign to open up new markets for chocolate. As you can well imagine, traditionally, the chocolate from our countries, uh, the raw material has gone into producing chocolate for essentially the Western markets, America, Western Europe. But there are now vast numbers of people in Asia, in China, in India, in Indonesia, 
Japan who are beginning to have the, the, the sort of disposable income that will enable them also to be able to, and that's the market that we will be targeting together with those who come to establish the facilities with us. So these are three, there's several other elements, the technical nature in it, but broadly, these are the immediate steps that we are taking and trying to attract people to come in and, and, and partner us. Uh, Adele Simmons. Uh, just, just if, Adele, Adele, just. I just deleted an email from my son which said if you want to use, lose weight, stop eating chocolate. No longer. Um, my question is about um, education in the villages and the communities outside Kumasi and Accra. You've talked a lot about education reform in the beginning, and I'm really wondering how successful you're being in reaching the communities outside the big cities. You have a major problem of infrastructure because most of the secondary schools in our country are concentrated in sp specific parts of the country. So establishing schools in the, as broadly as possible across the nation is a major challenge for us. We've been able to get a large sum of money, which is going to allow us to do that in the next two or three years. And in the same time, we now are finding a way of drawing schools in the remote parts of the country into the allocation of, of places within the sec secondary school system. So you're finding now that there are areas of the country whose children have never had the opportunity of going to any of the important schools in Ghana. Now it's being able, because of the, the quota system that we have, uh, imp we have divided, being able to now go to the schools that you know. You clearly know a lot about Ghana. Talk about Achimota and Infancipan and Adesadl and those schools are now receiving 30% uh, of their intake asked from schools from these uh, remote rural schools that don't have really the facilities that they should have. But we're doing it with the recognition that over a short period of time, the people, students from those areas can also catch up. These are interim measures that are being taken when we're trying to develop the infrastructure by having more and more schools in the country. No, leave it. Thank you, Mr. President, for your presentation. Could you please speak to the role you see for oil in the development of the Ghanaian economy? Um, Twelve years ago was when we first discovered oil offshore in Ghana. It was, in fact, discovered by an American company called Cosmos. They led the thing. And subsequently, uh, another company called Tallow joined them to produce uh, offshore oil. Up to this year, we've been producing some 200,000 uh, barrels a day, well, small, in the, in the global oil market but uh, producing significant revenues for the Ghanaian exchequer. It has been dealt with as just export of crude. We don't think that as the um, discoveries in Ghana continue now to be significant, and we've seen it now with the intervention of ACA, the Norwegian uh, big Norwegian oil company, and your own company, ExxonMobil, is now in Ghana. We are anticipating that by 2023, 2024, the latest, the amount of oil that we'll be producing will be in the area of about 500,000 barrels a day. Then we become a significant producer of oil. It's very, very important that we establish the petrochemical industries that will allow 
us to be able to give value to the soil and not just export it in its crude form. We don't have a fertilizer uh, plant in Ghana. We don't have a plant for the making of ethanol. We don't have a plant for the making of urea. These are the investments, and of course, uh, there's a very small refinery for crude itself, which is, I mean, is 40, 50 years old and having all kinds of challenges. But these are the facilities that we now want to put on the, on the ground. And uh, we think it is absolutely essential that we do so to be able to maximize the value of oil production for our country. But it's important because it, it, it makes possible and uh, facilitates also the industrial transformation of the country. It's an important role that it has to play. Alongside oil, we have large, large gas deposits in Ghana. In fact, the gas deposits in our country are even more significant than our oil deposits, large deposits of, of gas, which hopefully, um, we're working on it now, will be enable gas to become the, the almost the most the single most important uh, power of, uh, energy then um, with all its implications of bringing down the cost of energy and also issues of cleanliness and uh, uh, the protection of the environment that entails. So this is the other major development that is taking place as far as our hydrocarbon resources are concerned. Uh, Alexander Cruz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you touched on the need for better business models on contracts. I would love for you to paint that vision that you had about the fairness of a business model and contract potentially as a way of doing business going forward and how we might do that at scale. Every time we're making these agreements for the exploitation of, say, gold or resources, we are confronted with the phenomenon that the initial capital that is involved in being able to bring the gold out of the, country, out of the, the ground is, so con is such that all kinds of benefits, incentives, must be given to enable that to be done so that people can amortize their investments and make their profit as well. The structure that is set up traditionally up till now makes it very difficult for us to be able to police these arrangements. We find that, for instance, many of the companies that do business in Ghana, the intercompany pricing that goes on between them enables them to send large sums of money out of the country, allegedly under this agreement about incentives and uh, uh, conditions for the original investment. In areas like that, uh, it will be relatively easy to change that narrative so that we can have greater transparency. We're now insisting on it, greater transparency, for us to be able to see exactly what is going on and therefore produce a more level playing field. There are, I mean, and you can think of many areas of the extractive industries to which that would apply. And also looking at um, the payment of tax, it cannot be the case that the amortization of the investment of the mining companies can only take place if they don't pay tax in Ghana. That, the, the, to me, the, 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 there's, 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 every business has to factor into it the payment of corporate income tax. That has not been the case up till now. We want to change that also, that narrative and that set of statistics. These are the elements that we're trying to put for it, to have a fairer and more equitable arrangement between us and the mining companies. Dan Tierney. 
Thank you for speaking with us today, Mr. President. Uh, I'm curious how you see um, the evolution of solar power as uh, an important part of your uh, energy in the future in Ghana. I think that across the, the continent, it, it, it has to be a very critical part of our future energy needs. I mean, it's the one thing we have in abundance is, 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 is the sun. We've committed ourselves in Ghana last year to saying that by, by the end of 2020, 18 months from now, we're going to scale up the contribution of solar energy into our generation mix from what it was last year when the commitment was made, 1% to at least 10%. It's a considerable leap. And from there, build it up to 2025 and to 2030, by which time, hopefully, it will contribute the majority of our energy needs. Some obvious things are having to be done to signify the importance of this for the country. Jubilee House, which is where the president stays, told the people of Ghana that by the end of this year, it will be powered by solar energy exclusively. This is an, uh, an example that we want to give to the country. To, to that. But that's how significant it is. We have to be able to move that way for all the other reasons that you know about also in terms of the protection of our environment and the rest. But this is very, very important. Unfortunately for us, we're coming into it at a time when the cost of, of the technology itself is going down significantly all the time. So it's becoming well more and more within reach. Sammy Thompson. Uh, Mr. President, uh, communications and specifically wireless communications is an uh, is an area of interest of mine. In fact, we have investments in Ghana. Uh, could you speak to the role that you see with regard to the need for infrastructure, the role that you see communications, and particularly wireless communications, playing in supporting the you know, development priorities uh, for the uh, for the nation of Ghana? Well, so um, we are we have a very ambitious program of wiring up the whole country, sending fiber optics across the country so we can have that access, and also facilitating, for instance, the teaching of uh, of, the, uh, of our youth, especially in the remote areas through that technology. But um, it has to be yet another tool for us of rapid development. So the various electronic transactions that are being made in e-commerce, e-finance, e even the government system, all of them are directly connected with with, the, with this development. So, yes, it's an, an important tool for us for the development of the country. Nikolai, nice. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for being with us here today. Uh, you gave the example of China and your successful partnership in developing the uh, bauxite industry there. Uh, you also began your remarks by noting that America's absence uh, is, is fairly acute at this moment in Africa. Thinking of the partnership with China and their need for aluminum, for instance, that partnership uh, is very logical point uh, for you to partner. Are there arenas or areas in which you would find a common interest uh, where America and Ghana could easily form such a partnership to help in Ghana's development? An obvious area of, 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 of uh, 
communalities in our hydrocarbon resources, uh, American technology as far as offshore, even onshore tech development of, of oil and gas is, I think, second to none in the world, still today. And that's why some, a company like Exxon still has this dominant position in the, in the exploration business. I think that's an, an area where we could have a lot more interest in the American companies um, participating. Mr. President, thanks. So, uh, oh, Joan, you, did you want to? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Has Ghana experienced any climate change, or do have you any concerns uh, about climate change affecting your country agriculturally or in whatever way? I think everybody has to be very concerned about it. And we are in a part of the world, too, where we are feeding the effects of the Sahara's transformation as it comes further down south and the growing desertification of the Sahelian area. These are matters of very, very great importance and significance for us. Um, and allied to it is also the destruction of our environment and our marine resources, our oceans that is also taking place, all of which are, putting, are giving us uh, this, uh, the entry into this regrettable phenomenon that is affecting all of our lives, climate change. We, uh, the last uh, decade, have seen a systematic exploitation of our uh, of our land for gold, illegal gold results. We have a name for it in Ghana called Galamse, and we have been doing our best in the last two years to try and arrest that phenomenon. It has gone ahead with the pollution of our waters. So the, many of the rivers of the country have suffered from this success, and they are only now beginning to find themselves back to their former pristine condition. And um, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a worrisome matter for all of us. I don't think that Ghana is going to escape it like anybody else. But we have to be continuing to work at it to see how we can prevent it from destroying our, our country. Mr. President, I, I'm afraid uh, that we're out of time, which is Good. too bad because I think we could spend a, a few more hours learning about and talking about uh, Ghana. You've, you've mentioned uh, the opportunities that exist. Uh, what I take away is that America's absence is a problem. Uh, you're not alone in thinking that. Um, what I also take away is that American aid may not be as important as investment and trade. Uh, and presumably, uh, that is something that uh, all of us can, can help contribute to, uh, towards. We wish you all the best in your country. We congratulate you on uh, the uh, incredible progress you have already made and progress that I am sure you will continue to make as, uh, as you continue to serve as president. Uh, I wish we'd known it was your birthday. We would have gotten a, a, a cake. Uh, um, but with, uh, with that, at least we can uh, applaud you and, and thank you for coming thank with us here today. Thank, thank you. you.